And if you would please, uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. We're continuing in our study right now of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And we've gone through a number of them so far. And tonight we're going to be looking once again at the next one, which is simply called faith. So I'd like you to read with me Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, please. And let's read those verses together out loud. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And so this has been a very enlightening study, I think. But I think you're going to appreciate tonight because this is going to deal a great deal with our testimony. Our testimony. And you say, well, how does faith deal with testimony? You're going to find out in just a few moments. And our Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being able to be here tonight. Be with our folks who cannot be here tonight. Lord, we certainly miss them. Lord, I know today's weather's been crazy and those wind gusts of over 100 miles an hour in some places and even here in Manitou. And Lord, I just ask you to keep our folks safe and warm tonight and watch over them, those who are able to tune in. I pray that they would have good reception where they are. They'd be able to tune in for the entire service. And then, Lord, I pray that you'd be with our online family and I pray that you give all of us ears to hear and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And of course, you may be seated. And you folks at home can be seated too. I just thought I would say that. The seventh fruit of the Holy Spirit is faith. Faith of all things. And what is faith? That is, what is the faith that is mentioned here in the fruit of the Holy Spirit? And I say that on purpose because we have these definitions of what faith is, but how is it used here in Galatians chapter 5? Well, once again, we come to a picture word in the Word of God. I have used that term time and again. Folks have asked me what I mean by a picture word. And I mean it is a word or a phrase that draws a picture in our mind so that we can understand the word and how it is used. And so how it's used here, it's very, very important. And this particular word for faith is used actually more than 300 times throughout the New Testament, believe it or not. And uh, I checked it out, I looked at it, I, I started looking at the references over 300 times. And, but in most of the cases, it means basically the same thing. However, in Galatians 5.22, it takes on a difference, a different kind of meaning. And so I want you to see the difference tonight. I believe you'll understand it a great deal. You know, faith, I've often defined what faith is by saying faith is not believing God no matter what the circumstances. Rather, faith is obeying God regardless of the consequences. That's a great meaning for what faith is because faith is an action word. But the word that is used here in Galatians chapter 5 has a different meaning, a different kind of application. So first of all, if you've taken notes, and I know many of you have taken notes and are listening right now, and many of you receive the outlines, so I want you to pay special attention to this. First of all, number one, the Word of God is the source of faith. The Word of God is the source of faith. The Word of God says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Often I have heard Christians say, I went through a terrible trial. I went through an awful hard time in my life. I went through a very difficult circumstance, and it was in that circumstance that God gave me more faith. I just want to say, as much as I appreciate that statement, it is not accurate biblically. You see, faith is not produced by trials. There, faith is proven. Let me say it again. Faith is not a produced by trials because it is in trials that faith is proven. You see, it's like a kiln. And I remember when I was a, a, a junior hire, I worked with clay in my uh, Mr. Foster's art class at Woodview Junior High School. 
and we would work with our clay and we would pound it and get the little hard pieces out of it and all the bubbles and we worked with it a whole lot. Then we put it on a wheel. Then we did our best to try to form something uh, with our hands and uh, many things just ended up with two grooves in it making an ashtray out of it, just to be honest with you. But tried to make things like a, maybe a little piece of pottery some kind of a little catch-all or whatever it might be. But after we got done forming it with our hands, we would put it into the kiln, and the kiln will be running at hundreds and hundreds of, deg of degrees of heat. And if there was a flaw in what we were making, it would explode. It would blow up or it would crack. And so heat in a kiln does not cause a problem most of the time. What it does is it reveals a problem. It's like heat in a car engine. In that car engine, heat does not always cause a problem. Usually it reveals a problem first more than anything else. And the same, same thing is true about trials and testings in our lives. Those hard times we go through, those difficult days, those days where we, we, we don't know if we're coming or going, those days where we have no answers, uh, those days that, that just uh, they lay heavy on our shoulders, those are not the things that produce faith. Those are the things that actually reveal faith and try faith, you see. It shows what kind of faith that we have. It reveals um, maybe a weakness in our faith. And I, that's very important for us to understand. And faith, by the way, is not produced by self-hypnosis or positive thinking. Pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. And I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I know I can, I know I can. Uh, blab it and grab it and say it and slay it. I mean, those types of things that people say, uh, that, that is not what produces faith. It's the word of God that produces faith. You see, you can talk yourself into anything, but the one thing you can't talk yourself into is faith. Because faith is not produced by talking yourself into anything or telling yourself uh, how it's all going to work out, you see. Uh, how many times through these years in the ministry have someone told me, I just know God's going to do this. I have prayed it. I have spoken it. I have asked God. I have told him what I want. And I just know it's going to happen. Well, that's not faith. That's just positive thinking. And it doesn't always work out that way. And by the way, you never hear those testimonies. You hear a testimony where something may work out. But you don't ever hear somebody say, I claim this in Jesus' name, and it never happened. You don't ever hear that from anybody. You see, positive talk and, and having a positive attitude and all these other things that we read in these, uh, in these uh, power of positive thinking kind of books and magazines and that kind of psychological preaching that so many do from their pulpits. No, ladies and gentlemen, that does not produce faith. It is the word of God. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And Romans ten seventeen makes it clear that faith is the product of the word of God. I mean, the word of God, the, the Bible I have in my hands right now, that book, and there are many positive thinkers and positive speakers and say it and slay it and blab it and grab it type of Christians today who never open their Bibles and don't understand anything in it, but yet they'll say it. That's not faith, ladies and gentlemen. You see, your relationship with the Bible directly affects the kind of faith that you have. Let me say that again. Your relationship to the Bible directly affects your faith. What an important lesson that is. You see, faith is not repeating something to yourself so many times that it becomes part of you. You say, oh, yeah, you hear that. You say, you say it over and over and over again. Uh, and, and put your goal on the wall in your bedroom so that when you wake up and you see that goal and that's where you're headed and all these positive things. And I'm not saying that they're all wrong. I am saying that they are not faith and they don't produce faith. They may produce a positive attitude in you, and that's a good thing. There are too many negative Christians today, but that's not faith, you see. And so uh, it's not positive reinforcement, nor is it visualizing your desires. That is not faith. Faith is produced with the word of God. So let's just say the words together in Romans ten seventeen. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Very, very important. Number two, if you're taking notes, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is faith. That is a faithfulness to God and his word. The faith that is mentioned in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, 
speaks of faithfulness, fidelity, if I may use that word, a faithfulness. And here is the subtle difference, and it's found in other scriptures. If you're writing things down, let me give you three scriptures that mention this kind of faithfulness. Uh, Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. Now, wait a minute. How is a matter of the law a thing called faith? A matter of the law is a faithfulness, your trustworthiness, your fidelity. And so Jesus rebuked the scribes and the Pharisees and called them a bunch of hypocrites because that was less important than what they emphasized in their own lives. And then there's Romans chapter 3 and verse 3 where the Bible says, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God, somebody says, well, you know, the Bible says God will do this. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. And someone says, well, I don't believe that. Now, wait a minute. God is faithful to his word. If God made a promise, then God will keep his word. And that's what it's saying here. For what if some did not believe? What if they didn't believe what God said? Well, it doesn't change what God said. Just because someone says, well, I don't believe it. I don't think that's true. I don't think God will do that. No, that doesn't change God. And it says here, shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? No, their unbelief doesn't change anything about God, not at all. And then there's the verses that I want you to see in our verse in Titus chapter 2 and verse 10. The Bible says not purloining. I'll explain that to you in a minute. It says, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. The word purloining talks about stealing and violation of a trust. You can trust God's word. You can trust what he says. He says, showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. So we're talking here not about believing God or trusting God. We're not talking here about... Uh, obeying God. We're talking about just knowing that God is true and he's, his fidelity. You can trust what God says. You can trust. You can take it to the bank. You can believe it. It's not positive thinking, but if God has said it, then you can trust it. Why? Because God is faithful. The faith, that is the faithfulness, fidelity, the trustworthiness mentioned in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22 is something that only the Holy Spirit can produce in a believer. Ask you a question, are you trustworthy? Are you full of fidelity? You know, I like it. There's, there's a bank called Fidelity. I think of Fidelity Trust or something like, along those lines. Uh, there's another bank called Equity. They give these positive names talking about you can trust us. Uh, you can trust what we do with your money. You can trust what we do uh, with, uh, with your savings. You can trust what we do uh, with your CD and your IRAs and all the rest of us. So they have equity and they have uh, uh, the honesty and they have the fidelity. They have all that worked into their name. That's what we're talking about in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. Now, we understand so then that the faith that is produced by the Holy Spirit is not a strong belief for you to hold on to, but it is fidelity that shows to others that you are trustworthy and faithful. People need to know you're honest. And this is a fruit of the Holy Spirit in a surrendering Christian's life. You see, listen carefully to this differentiation. I I have emphasized it in my, in my notes tonight, but the word of God produces faith that causes you to trust God. The fruit of the Holy Spirit produces fidelity so that God and others can trust you. Let me say it again. Don't miss this. The word of God produces faith that causes you to trust God. The fruit of the Holy Spirit produces fidelity so that God and others can trust you. If you're not trustworthy, you don't, if, listen, if a pastor or a church is not trustworthy, uh, then they don't have a ministry. I don't care who they are. 
If they're not faithful to the word of God, if they're not faithful to their people, if they're not faithful to their families, if they're not faithful to their husband or to their wife, they have no trustworthiness. Holy Spirit produces that kind of fidelity in a surrendering Christian. Number three, if you're taking notes, number one, I said the word of God is the source of faith. Number two, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is faith. That is a faithfulness to God and to his word. Thirdly, by nature, we are without this fidelity. By our own human nature, we are without fidelity. Our fallen, human, sinful nature. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so that death, so that death, so that death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. We all have a human nature, a fallen human nature, and we are born without fidelity. The Bible says in Psalm 58 and verse 3, I think a verse that many people are fairly familiar with, but it simply says in Psalm 58, 3, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. It's what we're born with. It's part of our original equipment. Nobody has to teach a human being how to lie. They can only teach them how to do it more efficiently. Nobody has to teach a child to lie. It's part of their nature. And some children never outgrow it, even when they're adults. They live lives that are nothing but lies. And you think about that, a child, you know, says, are you telling the truth? Are you telling a lie? I'm telling the truth. And all they're doing is telling a lie. A little girl in our junior church many years ago, I love this illustration. Uh, one Sunday morning, they were being given circus peanuts. I love circus peanuts, those, uh, especially when they're fresh. And, but you know what? They're orange. And they'll leave your mouth orange. And so this little girl, uh, they were told in junior church or uh, whichever class it was in, not to eat their circus peanuts yet. And so this one little girl decided she was going to go ahead and obey. And they said, and, and, and the teacher said, uh, do you, are you eating cir your circus peanuts? And she opened up her little mouth and said, no. And all you saw was orange in that mouth. Well, I didn't have to teach that little girl how to lie. Now, somebody needed to teach her how to do it more efficiently like swallow first and gargle or something. But that was not in the offing on that night. No, you don't have to teach somebody, and you don't have to teach somebody how to steal. You have to teach them how to do it more efficiently. You don't have to teach somebody how to cheat. Why? Just somebody teach them how to do it more efficiently. Why? Because it's part of our nature. And Curtis Hudson said, anything that you have to be taught is not part of your nature, but anything you don't have to be taught is part of your nature. Think about that. And the Bible says here, when they are born, it says speaking lies. Born speaking lies. We are born sinners by our very nature. And we are born, listen now, we are born un unfaithful to the truth. It is our, it's, it's part of our nature. And according to the verses in Galatians 5, are contrary to the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. It says here in Galatians chapter 5, we read this, it says, for the flesh lusteth against the the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that they cannot do the things that you would. We find that it's just part of our nature. We're fighting against God. Fidelity is not something we are born with. It has to be something that we learn through the Holy Spirit's fruit. We are too selfish to be trustworthy on our own. That's just the way it is. Number four, trustworthiness actually begins with God. That's right. It actually begins with God. And 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9. Let me say it again. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9, it says, God is faithful. There you go. That doesn't mean that God has faith. That means God's faithful. And the Bible says, by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, trustworthiness begins and ends with God. That's the source of all of it. Now, you say, I thought you said that faith came with, uh, with the word of God. Well, who wrote the Bible? The Bible says, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Psalm 119 and verse 89. 
Trustworthiness begins and ends with God. In the meantime, we are to be trustworthy in his stead. That's what Jesus said, that we, as he was in this world, so are we in this world. If you have your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. As I said, faithfulness, this kind of faithfulness, begins and ends with God. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, most of you know the verse by heart, and that's okay, but look at it again like cornflakes, taste it again for the very first time. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. It says plainly, God is faithful. I can't trust God. No, you can't trust people. Some person a long time ago hurt your feelings and you lost your faith in people. Therefore, you blame that all on God. Why did God allow that to happen? So you say you can't trust God. No, you can't trust people. Say, I was hurt by a pastor. I was hurt by a pastor's wife. I was hurt by a child. I was hurt by a Sunday school teacher. I was hurt by a deacon. I was hurt by a a boss. I was hurt by some kind of an employee. No, 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 no. Don't blame that on God. God has no fallen nature. But someone says, well, I just can't trust God because. No, 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 no. You can't trust people, you see. Something interesting here. You see, God is true to his word. Now, a verse that everybody knows. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. And I love this. I've explained it through the years, time and time again. But you know, there's just something about some verses in the Bible. It's like a, it's like a new evangelical Christian said to me one time who was more of a liberal. He's, he looked and said, yeah, you Baptists like them proof texts, don't you? <laughs> and I looked straight at him and I said, oh yeah, I like proof text. If the Bible says it, that settles it. That's the end of it. But listen to this. You want to talk about a proof text on God's faithfulness? The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, why is he both? Why is he faithful and just? Well, God makes it clear. Number one, he's faithful to his word. What he says, he will do. What he says, he will do. And he's just toward his son. If God would not forgive us as sinners, then Jesus was foolish to die on Calvary. He died for that very reason, for forgiveness. He paid our sin debt. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. The Bible says that Christ died for us. The wages of sin is death, Bible says, Romans 6, 23. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The wage of sin is death. Christ died. He paid sin's debt, you see. So God is faithful to his word because he promised. And he's faithful to his son because that's why Jesus gave his life. Don't ever forget that. God is faithful and just. And number five, and lastly, God desires for you to be trustworthy as well. He desires for you to be trustworthy as well. Sadly, there are many believers today who are simply not trustworthy. They don't keep their word. Uh, They lie, they break laws, uh, all kinds of things, and they're just not trustworthy. Uh, They make a promise, uh, but they don't keep their promises. And what I'm saying is, is they're not trustworthy in so many ways. When it comes tax time, you find out there are many believers who are simply not trustworthy with their honesty, you see, and they need to be. Years ago, um, when we were up in Woodland Park, I've told this story a few times over the years, but it's like it's fresh in my mind. And um, a man came by. He was from a particular Bible college down south, and he uh, wanted to talk to me about being a CPA at our church, and he wanted to help us with our finances. And I showed him our finances. Our finances uh, were booked three different ways. His words to me before he left my office that day, he says, you're too honest. That's what he said. And that's an exact quote. He said, you are too honest. I said, how can you be too honest in the ministry? Years ago, a man came to me, and he offered our church, uh, up in Woodland Park again, he offered our church a telephone system, the kind you put in a closet. 
and you have the phones running with wires and all the different networking and all the rest of it. I guess it was like a Merlin system from years ago. And um, he wanted us to be able, he wanted to give it to us and install it and it will be ours. And then after he told me all about it, he asked me if I would be willing to backdate the receipt so that he could get a tax credit. And I looked at him and I said, you know I can't do that. And he said, I know you can't. And I thought, you know, praise the Lord. He thought of me that I was that honest, praise the Lord. And how thankful I am for that. The Bible, listen, this faith should be seen by whom? This faithfulness. First of all, it should be seen and recognized by the Lord. And don't say, well, the Lord knows. Go to Luke chapter 18. I want to read eight verses there for you. And I want you, I'll read, I want you to follow along with me in the word of God. But you know the Lord needs to see our faithfulness. He really does. See, well, doesn't he know all things? Let's read the passage. The Bible says in Luke 18, 1, it says, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. There was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjudge just saith, judge saith, And shall not God avenge his own elect? which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, the, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. He wants to see it. He wants to see it. So our fidelity needs to be to the Lord. And secondly, our fidelity needs to be seen by others. The Bible said again, we read this verse a little bit ago, Titus chapter 2 and verse 10, not purloining, which means to steal, not to steal, or uh, violating a trust. He said, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the gospel of God, the doctrine of God, our Savior in all things. Others need to see our honesty. They need to see it. The Bible says to let your moderation be known unto all men. Interesting and a beautiful word. A very, very old word. And what it means is we need to let people see our stand and our honesty. That's what it means. It doesn't mean to tell people you don't drink much. That's not what moderation means. Or you don't smoke much or you don't cuss much. No, moderation here is a word which goes all the way back to a little word called probity. P-R-O-B-I-T-Y. And it speaks of our honesty and our fidelity. Let it be known to all men. Yeah, others need to see that we're honest too. They need to know that we're going to tell the truth and not lie. They need to know that we're not going to tell a half-truth, which a half-truth is only half the truth, so that means it's half a lie as well. well interesting. Or a white lie. I only tell white lies. What's the difference? Color? White lies, black lies, whatever it might be. See, black lies matter as well as white lies matter. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have said that, but I done said it. And this is the adorning of the gospel. A Christian of trust speaks positively for the gospel. Speaks positively for the gospel. Oh, how important that is. Now, believe it or not, all of us were born with unfaithfulness inside of us, already born there. It's in there. It's like prego. It's in there. We're not going to get rid of it on our own. So, therefore, something has to happen after salvation. Our surrender to the will of God and to what God wants in our lives, constantly surrendering. And by the way, life <clears throat> is a series of surrenderings. And in the life of the surrendering Christian, the Holy Spirit can produce this fruit of fidelity. Someone says, oh, you never stop lying. You know, there are some sins you're supposed to stop doing. It's not, you're not above it, but there are some sins you ought to stop doing. And one of those is dishonesty. You ought to stop that. Just stop it. Why? Because you need that fidelity kind of a life. And so, if we are going to be trustworthy in our lives, we are going to have to allow the Holy Spirit to produce trustworthiness in our lives. 
And what we need to do is sort of take a, an inventory of our own life and find out if there are places where we are simply not trustworthy, not honest, not faithful, whatever it might be. You see, it's very, very important. I was talking with a pastor one time. He told me that he lied to his deacons. That was sad. He's in heaven now. But he said he made it a practice. If he didn't want his deacons to know something in his church, he'd simply tell them a lie. I looked at him like, you've got to be kidding. I'm not going to ever let you preach in my pulpit, you dirty, stinking liar. You lie to your deacons when you don't want them to know the truth? That's not fidelity. And by the way, that pastor was not, did not have fidelity in a lot of other areas too. Very interesting. You know, it doesn't just go one direction. It's sort of like a, a root of bitterness that spreads out. It's a root. So anyway, as we're looking at this, let me ask you a question. Are you, are you a trustworthy Christian? Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to, uh, to give you fidelity in your life? The fruit of the Spirit is faith. That is faithfulness to God, to his word, to others, because God is faithful in all things. Shall we stand?